Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Catholic Recon Testimonies from Reverts and Converts. I'm your host, Eddie Trask, and this week's guest is Austin Havish, who is a former Carthusian monk, former diocesan seminarian. He also uh, has a podcast called Think Catholic, as well as being the founder of Scent Evangelization. We will get into all of that um, in due time. Austin, welcome to the program. Eddie, thank you for having me. God bless you and your your apostolate uh, here. I'm, I'm so happy to tell a little bit of my story and maybe a little bit of scent evangelization. Um, yeah. Excellent. So. Excellent. Well, let's, uh, before you get into your personal story, why don't we uh, begin in prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So, brother, how did your journey begin? Yeah, it was a wandering one. Uh, praise God, I, I lucked out. I grew up in a half Catholic home. So my my mom was Catholic, my dad, uh, not religious at the time. They placed me in a Catholic elementary school, which would be my saving grace. The, my first, I didn't know this, but my first grade teacher, when I was uh, very little, she came up to the class and she said, uh, you have to go to mass on Sunday. And if your parents can't take you, call me and I'll, I'll take you. And so what does a little first grader do? I went up to my mom that weekend who had slept in. Apparently we were kind of going to mass, kind of not going to mass at the time. And I said, you know, mom, I know you're tired, but Mrs. Lane says we have to go to mass every Sunday. And my mom said in that moment, her heart shattered and she vowed never to miss mass ever again and we wouldn't but I don't remember that story at all but I do remember feeling the exact opposite in high school you know waking up begging God to let me sleep in and uh, but we were going to mass no matter what what was really a struggle for me and I think the statistics are behind it is for young men when they see their fathers not necessarily interested in the church, just what an impact that has on young men. And so as I was growing up, I was looking at my dad, who was, uh, you know, a real leader in the family, very intelligent, reading books. And I saw his judgment of the faith. And it was, it was having an impact on me, though I didn't necessarily, I couldn't point it out at the time. So as I, I go into middle school and high school, I'm beginning to have questions. I'm doubting, is this true? Really, those same objections that we hear is that is religion really just this pie in the sky, you know, uh, here to help people's, you know, struggle through their day to day, but there's not actually truth at the bottom of it. But I was at home and because of that first grade teacher, we were going to mass no matter what. So I was still going to church, but my heart was drifting farther and farther away. And so when I went to college, and now I had the freedom to go to Mass or not go to Mass. I did not. And like a lot of fallen away Catholics that I meet out in the neighborhood doing neighborhood evangelization, there wasn't a definitive break. There wasn't really, I will have a moment, uh, which I'll share here, that kind of made it more of an official break with the church for me. But more, it was just a slowly eroding, the slipping away of the underpinning of my faith the the moment that would take me away and of of all people i think i should have been prepared for what i would see at the university for a, a less religious society having a, a catholic elementary school upbringing and though i don't have a lot of memories at this time apparently i was i was kind of a, a pious child according to my my teachers we would they would give an award every year or so, you know, like most punctual, you know, best math student. And I, I got most religious, maybe in the fifth or sixth grade. And my dad, who's not religious, he put it on uh, the wall at his workplace. 
So I, so I did. I had a, a deep love for God somehow by God's gift. My sixth grade teacher had told me that at this time I had asked her about the priesthood, about becoming a priest. My dad will later tell me that I'll go up to him and ask him about being a priest. And he'll say, no, 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 you know, you want to be a, a Baptist preacher or a Methodist preacher, because in that way you can go get married. And uh, you're a father, Eddie, and maybe, uh, you know, you would understand that desire to have maybe grandkids uh, more more than I would understand. But my dad, he was he was very serious about me having a family, not uh, being a celibate priest in the in the Catholic Church. So the the break is I get into college as I take a philosophy class, and in this philosophy class, intro to the philosophy class, I remember the TA was talking about our final paper. And he said, you've got three choices. You can either talk about a free will, you, um, you can defend free will, or you can defend determinism, which is we're just atoms and chemistry, and there is no such thing as free choice because those are bound by physical laws. Physical laws don't choose things, or somewhere in between, which is compatibilism. And he said to us, and I remember this, he said, if, if you are going to defend free will, you have to prove the immaterial soul, the immaterial subsistent soul. And he's right on that. Because if there's not more, as I said, if there's not more than chemistry and we're just the brain, chemistry, they, there's, there's no choice there. There's no freedom there. So he was he was right on that. You do. You have to do a lot of work if you're going to defend free will, which society, of course, is based on. We put people in prison because we feel they could have done otherwise. We reward people because we feel they could have done otherwise. So humanity assumes it. And we're right to assume it. But if someone tests you, you do. You've got to go through the math on the existence of the soul. But I'm a freshman in college. What do I know? I can't do this. You know, I went to a public high school. I have no, you know, Aristotelian background. I've never read Plato before. So I'm completely helpless. I'm unprepared. And I and I would say he wasn't malicious in any way. And I also wouldn't say he was telling us what we had to write on. But I could tell whether he was trying to show it or not, that he didn't buy it when it came to the soul. He didn't think that there was such a thing. And, and because he didn't think it, and he's our you know, authority here on philosophical matters, I didn't really think it either. So I didn't even bother to look into it or to research it. I wrote a paper on material determinism and I turned it in and it would take two weeks before it would sink into my heart. So it was here. I'm just atoms and all there is is atoms, but it hadn't come down to the heart. It took two weeks for that to happen. And I remember this moment I was stepping off a bus and I, I really believed it. You know, I believed that, you know, nothing I would do or did, none of it mattered. There was, there was no God, there's no soul, there's no immaterial anything. And it wasn't like a lightning moment, but something had been lost. I had lost something. Uh, at this time, and so I just began to live as every other college, no, I can't say that, um, as stereotypically college students do so i lived a kind of a life of pleasure and i at this time it's interesting to me eddie if someone would have came up to me and said are you happy i would have said oh yeah you know of course i'm i'm happy but i don't think that would have been true and i heard a ted talk i don't know when this was but it was a psychologist and he was saying the the continuum is not between happiness on one side and depression on the other side he said, we tend to look at it like that. But he said, I don't think it's like that. He said, you've got depression on one side. And on the other side, you have vitality. So he said, judge yourself on those barometers. If you have vitality on one side and you have depression on the other side, you know, are you actually depressed? Is your life, you know, one of depression and you don't actually know it? If I would have judged these years here in college on that barometer, I was very, probably very close to depression. I had lost vitality, vigor. You know, there was no excitement to get up in the morning. I lost all real purpose in life. Why am I here in school? What am I doing? All of those things had been lost. Even though at any moment, if someone would have asked me, are you happy? Yeah, of course I'm happy, but I'm, I'm probably very close to depression here, as the psychologist is, is pointing out. So my life is unwinding. In, uh, in this time here, these four years in college, I will I will have a, a just a couple conversations um, incidents where I had an experience that C.S. Lewis says is kind of 
necessary for conversion. And uh, you were speaking to our, our podcast, the Sig Catholic podcast. We Yesterday, we talked about evangelization and the necessity, which C.S. Lewis is going to say in more poetic words, but the necessity to see oneself in need of repentance before one can actually repent or to convert. C.S. Lewis says the moment we turn to God is the moment we see ourselves as no longer the good guys. When we can really honestly look in the mirror and say, you know, I'm, I'm a bad guy. I'm not. You know, I need help. Like I need to change. And for me, I would say that was my sophomore year at KU. Just a slow, slow, slow spiral uh, into a life of meaningless, senseless pleasure, no purpose. But I could finally look in the mirror one day and say, I'm not one of the good guys. And that was the beginning of my my journey back. What 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 caused you to be able to say that in the first place? Yeah, I I was, you know, I was dating at the time and that that relationship, uh, you know, and the the girl I was dating, I don't think she would have considered herself religious in any way. But, I, you know, I could I think I could tell that she when she looked at me, you know, in her conversations with me, she 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 could say that very honestly, you know, that I wasn't I wasn't a morally upstanding, not not the good guy in the story. So her judgment really, which is what I needed. I needed a, I needed a third person judgment <laughs> on this. Yeah. Uh, you know, cause sadly as, as we, we change so subtly, I don't know if you've heard that the anecdote about how to boil a frog. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly how it was. You, you slowly turn up the heat frog doesn't notice and then it, it boils alive. So it was such a gradual descent that I needed someone outside of me to look at, look at me. And it might've been, you know, just a couple comments here or a couple looks here, but I could tell, I could tell in her, in her opinion, like I, you know, I was, I was one of the bad guys. And I don't know if that, if that struck me, you know, like her opinion was so monumentous to, to me that it would have, it moved me to conversion. I wouldn't say that. I, I would say that uh, her analysis though was enough was enough for me to to agree and say, you know, I, I need to change. And so I reached out. And the only person I felt I could reach out to now is a is a Protestant uh, friend of mine who I had gone to uh, middle school and, and high school with. And so I, I reached out to him. I took him to be trying to do the right thing. And he invites me to his Bible study. He's taken me to his non-denominational church. And what's and I tried to do the right thing. And I'm, as probably many fallen away Catholics who join another Christian, a Christian congregation are, are trying to do. Yep. I didn't have the sacraments, though. I mean, how I've been to confession. I don't have the, the Eucharist. I don't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because of the life that I've lived. So I'm trying to do a moral law, Jesus's moral law, which presupposes you have Jesus's helps, that you have the sacraments, you have grace. So I'm trying to do the impossible, basically. And I'm I'm chipping away. You know, slowly, slowly living what I would have considered a more morally correct life. But I always, you know, this frustration of I'm trying to do something impossible here. Why is this so impossible to do? Uh, and another thing that I think was fascinating to me is that Catholic identity stamped on my heart. So uh, one moment I remember I was at well, this Bible study. And uh, at some point, the leader, he says, OK, well, we finished this Bible study. Austin, are you ready to be baptized? How do you feel about being baptized? And I said, well, I th I think I've been baptized, which, of course, I had as a, as a Catholic going to elementary school. And he says, no, 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 no. Now that you know what baptism is, you know, are you ready to, to be baptized? And what I said to him, and I didn't think about it, it was just, you know, knee jerk reaction. I said, well, let me talk to a priest. Let me call a priest. Now, I haven't been to the Catholic Church in years. Now, I, I've never, I don't associate with the Catholic faith in any way. I don't call myself a Catholic. But I somehow, in my mind, because of that elementary school experience, I would, at that time, I will always connect the religious authority with the priesthood. If there's a question on theology, who knows? Well, the priest knows. I need to go ask the priest. So I call, I call a priest that I knew from years ago. And he said, I said, should I be baptized? And he said, 
well, haven't you already been baptized? And I said, yeah. And he said, you know, don't even worry about it. And uh, so I didn't, but I kept going to the non-denominational Bible study. I'm still going to the church. And I think one of the reasons why I was able to do those two things, how I was able to stay in my heart, kind of Catholic. I remember at some point speaking against, I remember one comment I made about the hierarchy. I felt like maybe that was a human construct. I do remember saying that to my shame. But short of that, I don't remember ever speaking against the Catholic faith. So on the one hand, I'm I'm still kind of Catholic in spirit, let's say, or like by identity or by tradition. But I'm going to the non-denominational church. And why I'm able to do those two things without feeling the tension or a contradiction is because of what I'm being taught at the non-denom church. I remember being told at this church that you can go to any church you want, provided the music is to your liking, providing provided the preaching is to your liking. So, yeah, so that's how I was living. And even when I would go visit my family, I would go to Catholic Mass. If I was there on a Sunday, I'd go to Catholic Mass with my mom. Because, again, as I'm being taught where I'm going to church, it's all kind of the same. So, so I felt I could kind of do both. So I do that for college, those four years at the University of Kansas. I graduate. I take a, a job at the University of Kansas. They hire me uh, marketing manager of international programs. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to present the university in such a way that we would bring international students to KU, that it would be attractive, that sent me to China a couple of times just to do basically market research to speak with Chinese students. And, and I remember having a conversation with uh, one of these events that the university had sponsored to get their name out there is a debate tournament in China. And I'm sent because I'm the marketing guy, the debate coach for KU is sent. He's going to judge. Uh, he gave a speech at the beginning too. And I remember we were standing outside this, uh, you know, I don't know, theater where they were having the debates. And he looked at me and he said, are you a faith guy or a reason guy? And I said to him, well, I think faith is reasonable. And then I, I gave what I knew, but I remember the story because I wasn't, I wouldn't consider myself at the time, kind of a sit in the pew, keep to yourself Christian, even though I'm, I'm here at the non-denominational church. I, I thought it was true. And because I thought it was true, I thought people needed to know about it and it was important. So I'm, I'm trying to preach the faith in any way that I can. I'm trying to witness to Christ any way that I can. And so I do the four years, I the job, and I probably, anyway, I probably would have stayed Protestant, honestly, to this day. I'd probably still be going to a, a Christian church of some kind if it wasn't for a chance homily that I heard when I was back home going to Mass with my mom. So I'm back at home with my mom. I'm sitting in the pews in the small village I grew up in. There's about 10,000 people in this city. And the priest, it's John 6 of the readings. And he, he reads John 6 and he says, uh, the reading, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water. No, sorry, it's John 3, 5. Uh, John 6, uh, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one eats the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood, you have no life in you. And the priest, he says, he, his homily, he says, now we, we believe that the Eucharist here in the Mass is the body, blood soul and divinity of Christ. And he said, now our Christian brothers, our other Christian brothers who aren't Catholic, don't necessarily believe that. Now, Eddie, I don't know about yourself. That was the first time I had ever heard that. I had grown up in Catholic elementary school. I knew what I believed, but I didn't know there was such a sharp distinction. Now, the, the priest had drawn a line in the sand. You know, we believe this. Most everybody or everybody believes something else. So now I had a dilemma. I needed to figure out which side of the line I'm on. If I think that the Eucharist is just a symbol, I can go to most any church under the sun. But if I think that it is Jesus, well, I need to go to this place where that's possible. I need to come back to the Catholic Church. So I have this dilemma. I step out of the church and immediately the wheels are turning. You know, who do I have to call? Because I, Eddie, I was, I was zealous about the truth. Wherever the truth is, that's where I want to be in it. I, I could totally, and I was holding my hands open. I wasn't, uh, I didn't have a prejudice 
uh, towards any particular creed or code. Even though I was raised Catholic and I still had kind of that stamp, if the Catholic truth was false, I didn't want to be there. Yep. So whatever was true, that's where I wanted to be. I step outside this church and I, I call a priest. I ask him what he thinks. He says, well, yeah, I read John 6. I mean, it's clear. And it is clear. It's very clear. I mean, Jesus says it as many times as he can to get the point across. They don't believe him. He keeps saying, you know, he doubles down. He asks them if they want to leave. Uh, he's just so incredibly serious about this teaching. But then what really did it for me, Eddie, is the priest said, go look at Justin Martyr writing in the hundreds AD to uh, in temp uh, the emperor Antonius Pius, Apology 1, yep. a letter on what, what Christians believe, which I assume you're familiar with. Yeah. And as you read down that document, he says what Christians do on the day of the sun, he, he calls it. He says, uh, we we gather together. The We have one reading from the scriptures, which for them, as the canon of the New Testament is still being put together, the scriptures is, that's the Old Testament. So we have one reading from the Old Testament, just as we do today. We have one reading, he calls it the memoirs of the apostles, which will later become in the canon, the gospels. One Old Testament reading, one New Testament reading. He says, we have someone bring up the gifts. We exchange the kiss of peace. We have the person who presides uh, ask us to imitate these beautiful things, the homily. I mean, this is the mass. For anyone who's listening to this, who's gone to a Catholic mass, this is the mass being written here in the hundreds. And then he says, he says, and the one who presides prays over the bread and the wine. And we believe that it's not just bread and wine, but it becomes the flesh of Jesus who took on flesh. And I read that, Eddie, and I said, I'm going back <laughs> because... If anybody knows, and maybe it was my simplicity, someone else might have read that and said, you know, no, I like I like my friends at the non-denom church, or I like the music, or I like the morals or something, but that was never my thing. It's what's true, and I'm going to go wherever that happens to be. And so when I read that in the hundreds AD, here's this man who probably either knew the apostles or knew men who knew the apostles, who has said, this is what Jesus thinks. All right, well, then that's what I'm going to think. And so I, I decided to go back. And so now I'm, I'm scrambling. Where's the Catholic church uh, where I go to work? I find a couple in the city. The one that I had been to when I was first in college was the campus center. This is, I think, in January, though. So they're closed for Christmas break. So I need to find somewhere else to go to. I find uh, another church in the city. And I, I pull aside the priest afterwards no no what is it no so i'm i'm scrambling to come back and i start actually at do i start at the campus center hmm, what was the first thing that i did i think i yeah no i went back i went back to the campus center so i was i was going to to mass in those various places in the city but what the christians at the non-denom church had taught me is that you need community and if you don't have community you're not going to make it so i took that lesson with me so I go to this campus center and I had one plan just to grab the first guy I meet and say, hey, you know, can you get plugged in? Can you can you help me here? So at the campus center, they have mass. After mass, they have a spaghetti dinner downstairs. I go downstairs, get my spaghetti, sit down at a table. And the first guy to sit down at a table next to me, I say just that. I say, hey, you know, I want to get plugged in. Can you help me in any way? And he says, for sure. I'm actually a focused missionary. So the first person to sit at the table, focus stands for uh, for your listeners, Fellowship of Catholic University Students. These people, they're normally recent college grads. They raise support, fundraising, so they go back to those universities and find people like me, find the fallen away Catholics. So it just so happens in God's providence that the first guy to sit at this table with me is the best guy I could be speaking to about this. And so he invites me to what he calls an upper room where he gives a speech and, and he says, and I'll, I'll remember it to this day. He says, if you don't pray, you don't know God. And I was sitting in the back, arms crossed, you know, kind of looking around and I hear that. And I, I want to do whatever I'm supposed to do. You know, what's the right thing to do. And now he's telling me that I need to pray and I don't know how to pray. And, you know, does anyone know how to pray? I, I think of uh, St. John the Baptist's disciples who have to go to Jesus and say, teach us how to pray. You know, if you think anybody would know how to pray, surely they would know how to pray. I remember 
well, as an aside, Eddie, I remember when I was a Carthusian, when we think about Catholic religious orders who should know how to pray, we normally think about the monks, especially the Carthusians. And our prior was asked by one of the Carthusian nuns, can you teach me how to pray? And he said, how do I know? You know how do I know how to pray? So all of us are, are learning, but I had no clue, absolutely no clue. But I thought back to my Catholic elementary school days, and I thought the rosary, you know, I can pray the rosary, definite amount of time, definite amount of beads, I can do that. But I didn't have a place to pray the rosary at. And I knew if I, well, I felt that if I tried to do it after work, at my eight to five, I just wouldn't do it. I wouldn't make time for it. So I thought to myself, I need to find a church that opens up before eight in the morning so I can pray the rosary at. So I'm back in Lawrence, Kansas, is where the KU's at. And I, the campus center is not going to open at that time, or at least I thought that was the case. So I went to another church in the city after Sunday mass. I pull aside a priest and I say, what's the earliest time a church opens in the city? And he says, well, this one opens at 630 in the morning. I said, well, I'll be here. And this priest is probably like in his 80s. And so he looked at me. I'm in my 20s. You know, and he looked at me with that face of, you know, sure, sure. We'll see you at 630 in the morning. Monday, I was there. 630. I pray my rosary. I go to work. Tuesday, I get there like 650. Pray my rosary, go to work. Wednesday, get there like 710. Pray my rosary, go to work. So it's slipping. You know, I'm losing my grasp here. Thursday, I get there at 740. And I notice there's people already in the church. So I go into the cry room, pray my rosary. I leave and all day I'm thinking to myself, what are people doing at the church on 740 on a Thursday? You know, when did they get there? I've been there at seven. I've been there at six. I've been there. <laughs> so, so Friday, I, I determined to figure out what these people are doing. So I show up at, I thought, well, maybe they showed up at 730. Something's going on at 730. So I get there at 725. I sit in the back. Mass starts at 730. You know, who knew mass on a weekday? I didn't know that. You know, when I was in Catholic elementary school going to mass the couple of weekdays, I thought that was just because I was part of the Catholic elementary school. I didn't know of mass outside of Sundays. Mass starts. I thought, well, mass is an hour long. going to be late to work. But, you know, I got to see it. And then mass ends at like 7.55. And I said to myself, I can do this. So from that point on, I would go to mass every morning. I would go to work. I would drive back to that church and I would pray the rosary. And Eddie, that changed me. And, and there's many times when I was a non denom Christian and people would ask me, you know, well, when were you saved? You know, when did you take Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? And I would tell them of moments that I felt answered that question. But Eddie, this is the first time that I, my desires changed. And for me, that was a real change. I, for the longest time, Eddie, there were two things to my life. Get the next job, A. Uh, my, uh, <laughs> I don't think I look at today, but uh, I was all about the gym. You know, every, I had the $100 meal plan. I'm going to go in the morning. I'm going to go in the evening. I, I kind of inherited that from my, my family and friends. But those are my two things. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to have a career. And that's all that matters. My life was very simple. And I was comfortable because of that. But now that just started to edge away, started to edge away. I saw my job as the job. I lost interest really over, almost overnight in the Swole project. You know, dropped that. And, and then at the same time as these things, I'm going to call them you know, not that they're bad in themselves. So I'll just call them like secular dreams sure. are losing the, the, the strength behind them. At the same time, I'm growing in charity. Uh, I had just an unbelievable, just a remarkable out of nowhere love for my immediate family. I would bring gifts to my mom every time I would visit her, whatever I could think of, things for her coffee and bring things for the kitchen. I would, you know, just little gifts. And I thought, you know, why am I doing this? I don't, I don't know. I just wanted to, I would call my sisters every day uh, to their great annoyance, but I would every, every day, two younger sisters call them every day. And so I'm changing Eddie at a depth that doesn't make for much of a story, you know, there, but it was so profound for me. It's just like, it just, it's such a deep, deep way 
I was becoming unremarkable to myself. So at this time, I uh, had applied for a promotion at Boston. So we, I was working at KU, but we were working in uh, collaboration with a, a company out of Boston. So I, I was at that moment doing marketing for one school, but I had applied to kind of work the portfolio in more of a more of a sales capacity, really. And I had been interviewing this whole time, and I get a phone call, and they said, "All right, we're going with you. Do you uh, do you have a place in Boston to stay? We've got a desk for you here." And I turned down that job. I turned down that job because I told him, I said, I didn't want to be far from my family. That had never mattered to me, Eddie, ever, you know, in my whole life. I would have never made decisions because of how close I was to my family or even Eddie, sadly, I'd say my, my family's opinion necessarily on my decisions. But I said, I can't. Yeah, I don't want to be that far from my family. I hung up the phone and now I was completely above water. I didn't know who I was. I mean, uh, as I said, that my life was very one direction, just the next step to the next step. So I needed help and guidance. So uh, just like I stumbled on mass, I stumbled upon a Capuchin priest at the cam uh, campus center. I hear two students talking about spiritual direction. And uh, I say, what the, what's that? They say, you sit down with a priest. You ask him some questions about your life. I say, okay, well turn to the Capuchin priest next to me. I say, can we do this spiritual direction sometime? He says, sure. Pencils it in over the noon hour because I have work. I walk down to his office over the noon hour and Eddie, I don't, I'm still getting used to this Catholic thing. So I don't know how this stuff is supposed to work. Sure. I know I need adv advice, but I don't know what, I, like, am I supposed to come prepared with something? So I thought maybe I should bring a religious topic and the thing that struck me, Eddie, is a verse that had plagued me and it stuck with me throughout all my wanderings, wherever I'd happened to be. I'd always loved this verse. It's Matthew 19, 21. The man comes up to Jesus. What good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, if you'd enter into life, all the commandments. The younger truly says, well, I've done that since I was a boy. What still do I lack? And then this verse, if you would be perfect, go Sell all that you have, give to the poor, you have treasure in heaven, come follow me. And we know what the rich ruler does. He walks away sad. And I had loved that story. I love that story because it's kind of has that poetic, sad, uh, this sad and sweet tone to it. I think it maybe in some ways I felt like I identified with it, especially as a young guy. Uh, you know, I'm living in Lawrence, Kansas. You're paying $200 rent. You know, I've got a, you know, a good job. So I, I felt in some sense that, yeah, that maybe this had, this had identified me. So I bring that up. I say, Father, here's this verse. I've always connected with it. That's the first thing I say, Eddie. And he sits back, brown robe, long beard, bald head. You know, he's a very stereotypical monk. And he says, this is our first meeting. He says, have you ever thought about being a priest? And it shocked me because it had come out of left field. I felt like it come out completely out of left field. But what I said, I think, shocked me even more. I said, Father, I'm afraid to think about it because I'm afraid that it might be what I'm supposed to do. Oh, man. And and I had not, I mean, Eddie, I was not thinking about this at all. I was not thinking about the priesthood. Uh, those stories when I was in elementary school, going to my dad, going to the sixth grade teacher about being a priest, I don't remember those. I, th those are Those are told to me. All I know is for my entire life, whenever someone had ever asked me, have you ever thought about being a priest? I remember not only did I say no, but I remember, Eddie, that it, it had always had zero impact on me emotionally. When someone were to ask the question, I, didn't, I wouldn't think about it later that day. I mean, it was just totally nothing off the table, nothing at all. And now for the first time in my life, I'm asked and I say, I'm you know, I'm afraid to think about it. And I was so scared and I think nervous by that response that I, and now it's silence. <laughs> He's just staring at me, letting that, my own words sink in. So I had to say something else. So I said, but father, my dad right now, he's not Catholic. So if I go do the priest thing, whatever that entails, I knew that would mean probably moving. So I wouldn't be close to my dad. I said, father, if I go do that priest thing, 
who's going to take care of my dad? Meaning like, who's going to bring him into the faith someday? I, you know, I'll influence him. Hopefully if I visit him, maybe over time, priest doesn't miss a beat, sits back, you know, with his beard and he thinks, and he says, doesn't that sound, he actually said, he said, can I prod? Cause this is our first meeting. He said, can I prod? I say, yeah, father say, you know, speak freely. He said, doesn't that sound like the man to say, who says to Jesus, yeah, I'll come follow you. But first let me go bury my father. And I said, uh, you know, I don't know. And he said, do you know what Jesus says back to that man? He said, uh, follow me, leave the dead to bury their own dead. I stepped out of that meeting, Eddie, having never thought about the priesthood now positive, that that's what God wanted me to do. I called the diocese from the parking lot. From the parking lot, I called him and I said, what's the application material? Who do I need to talk to? How do I get this started? I entered the seminary that fall. My dad enters the Catholic Church the Easter after me the next year without me. Without my influence, I wasn't there. Totally in God's providence. Uh, yeah. And I never looked back, Eddie. I never did. I, I would go from diocesan seminary, that same verse, which is where we get the religious state. When Jesus says those things, sell all that you have. Come follow me. We take that line. We get the three vows of a religious poverty, chastity, obedience. So I that same verse carried me. I went from diocesan priesthood, then into the religious state of the Carthusians, and then God willing, I'll hopefully be a Dominican next uh, July. So, you know, praise God. And I have to, I have to thank God uh, for the work of my father's life. My dad, Eddie. I mean, he is on fire. Uh -huh. <laughs> he will. I mean, he is such an evangelist. He told me the other day. He goes. I don't knock doors, but he's talking to people at his work. You know, he's talking to his family. He will not listen to an argument against John 6 and the true presence that Jesus literally means this is my body and blood. And I one compliment that my sister gave to me in this conversion, which I would apply to my father as well, which I think is a uh, real witness to true conversion. My sister, she said to me, as I'm going through this, she said, you know what, Austin? I know you. I know you, right? I've lived with you. My sister's not that far behind me, maybe six, seven years. So maybe quite a bit behind me, but we had a lot of time living together in the same house before I moved out of college. Uh, she says, I know you. I know you. So when we're at home, and you can't fool your family, uh, you know, sadly, as we know, uh, she, she said, I know you. And so we'll be at home. Something will happen. And I'll say to myself, now I know exactly what Austin's going to do. I know exactly, and I know exactly what he's going to do because I've seen him do it a thousand times, exactly the same way in exactly this same scenario. And she said to me, she goes, but now I'll say that to myself and then you'll do something different. And she'll say, it's like, I don't even know you. It's like, I don't even know you. I will say the same thing about my dad as I watched my dad's conversion. We'll have situations at home, and I'll say to myself, I know exactly what hit dad, how dad's going to react right now. I know exactly what he's going to do. I know what he's going to say, because I've seen it a thousand times, and then he'll do something different. And I'll say the same thing. I don't even know you. I don't even know you. And that's, yeah, that's the that's the work of God. So Fantastic, brother. So how many years ago was that, that you had entered the seminary? Okay, so I graduated from college. In 2015, I spent a year working, I think 2016, the fall of 20. Yeah, the fall of 2016. 2016. Okay. And then how did that transition? I mean, how was the call to the Carthusians and then discerning, I guess, out of that? Or if you can speak to that, yeah, that process as well. Yeah, I it, really the discovery of the difference between the religious state and the secular priesthood based on that call, that verse. So it would break my heart sitting in classes at seminary and them saying, you know, you're a secular priest. I mean, that's actually the technical term for a parish priest. You're a secular priest versus a, a religious priest. And the difference is that those vows. So uh, a parish priest, he has his own bank account. You know, he, he owns a car. His superior, of course, is the bishop. But the bishop is going to leave you alone. If you're a pastor, you have, by canon law, a jurisdiction here. You make the call. So you don't, if you're a pastor, if you're a parochial vicar, you're going to take probably orders from your pastor. But 
if you're a parochial vicar, you're a CEO of a, and I don't mean to disparage parish priests in any way, but it's just to show how different these two lives are. As a parish priest, and depending on your diocese, you know, you inherit the parish. They put the church under your name. The bank accounts are under your name. I mean, so you, you overnight, you become, you know, you know, a half millionaire, a millionaire, or, uh, you know, you, you take ownership of, of this area. You have your own salary. People cannot tell you what to do if, if you're a pastor and all that's all well, good and fine and praise God for our pastors. And that's just the necessity of their job. That's what they have to do. That totally makes sense. But for me, when I looked at the poverty of Christ, you know, when I out in the desert and laying on the ground, having nothing to his own, they had some money in common. When I look at the life of Christ, his total obedience to the father always, you know, I do I do the the, the will of the father is his food, as he said, my, my food is to do the will of the father. When I look at the life of Christ and are called to imitate his Christ, his life as well as we possibly can, according to our state. When I look at the Dominican, you know, he owns nothing. He has no will. He has no will. His superior tells him what to wear. He tells him what to do today, his rule. He tells him where to go. He tells him everything. So uh, St. Thomas Aquinas will say, what's the greatest sacrifice? Like how, do, as the psalmist says, uh, what shall I render to the Lord for all that he has done to me? How do I give back? I want to, I want to, like the wise men, I want to give back to God. I can give of my money by giving to the poor. I can give of my time, maybe by, you know, prayer, uh, by an apostolate. But Aquinas says the greatest gift, the most precious thing, Eddie, I have is my will. It's free choice. That's the most, that's what separates me from the dogs and the cat and the walls. All of these things, the most valuable treasure I have is free choice. How do I give that to God? Romans 13, 1, be subject to the governing authorities for there's no authority except from God. Those authorities that which do exist have come from God. So in a religious order, when you have a, a legitimate superior, it is true that when I give of my will to this representative of God, I'm giving it to God. So I, so Eddie, I want, I, I want to give God everything that I have. I think he deserves it. You know, which you're going to agree with. Everyone's going to agree with that. And the the gift of the other states of life, uh, for me, uh, they're different and they're beautiful. But this is the one, according to Jesus's words, if you would be perfect. you know, Very, go, very go good. Do. So then what would you say leads to that total abandonment the the idea of letting go of of one's will what I, that's mm -hmm. not not it's not simple um for mm -hmm. most people that listen would say i've been working on that for many many years and <laughs> so how would you i know uh different people have different opinions about what one can do of course it matters based on state of life and a number of factors mm -hmm. but if you were to generalize what is it that you see that that would help uh, okay, uh, with giving to the Lord, I think, as as you've said, it's different according to different states. So I would I would say for your listeners, Jesus in that verse, that Matthew nineteen twenty one, he he lays out those three tasks, but he gives to all of us in Matthew six those three vows in a degree and in a way that each one of us can hold ourselves to 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 be to give of ourselves back to God in gratitude. So Matthew 6, Jesus says three things. He says, uh, when you pray, well, which is very similar to, uh, you know, the rule of prayer, which the monastic or the religious text. So when you pray, he says the Our Father. When you fast, uh, which is very similar to the religious vow, not only to, uh, you know, do his rule, but he fasts you know, from the pleasures of marriage by being a celibate or a virgin for the nun. So, so when you fast, when you give alms, the religious, the alms he gives is his will. He gives over his will. Not only does he not own anything, but even those, those, uh, those goods of the heart he gives away. So I, I would say for every one of us to really lean into Matthew six, do I pray? What does that look like? 
do I give alms? What does that look like? Uh, do I fast? And what does that look like? And not only is that a way of self-gift, but it's also an antidote to those three temptations of the world. First uh, John, I think it's 2.16. All that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, which Jesus recommends fasting. The lust of the eyes, which is greed. Jesus recommends almsgiving. And the pride of life, which Jesus recommends uh, prayer, actually, because it's it's a humble thing that I, I need to kneel before God and ask for help. So, so we... We have a small religious life contained in Matthew 6 for all of us, those three spiritual practices. I think, Eddie, for those listening, that's that's the, probably the best place to start. Am I doing these three? Am I doing them well? Am I doing them daily? And, and that'll lead me into a deeper availability and freedom for that self-gift according to my particular state. Well said. Um, you want to take some time to talk about Think Catholic and scent evangelization. Yeah, Eddie. I of course I would. Uh, you know, thanks for bringing them up. So for, for your listeners, uh, thinkcatholic.org, Think Catholic podcast. The idea is to bring Catholic thought with depth and devotion. So we cover everything from proofs for God built into contemporary science. We go through is Scripture historically reliable? Excuse me. I was taught at one point that if you wanted to bring someone from nothing to the truth of the Catholic faith, there was a road you could take. The first thing you would do is you'd show them that God exists. The second thing, you would show them that Scripture is historically reliable, that we can trust, not, not, uh, not that it's inerrant or it's inspired by God yet, but simply that the document is true. That the people who wrote down that Jesus walked oh, here, that he you're saying he baby steps it. for for the people. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. So kind of this 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 ladder of you know if you meet someone that's just never heard of anything as a complete atheist. So on thinkcatholic.org, we try to represent this road. So we have not only an article for each one of these pieces, but a an art uh, a podcast episode. So the first again, you have to show someone God exists. The second, that Scripture is just a historical document. Then within that historical document, Jesus says that he's God, then he proves that he's God. Like, and what would that mean? How do you prove your divinity? So we talk about that. And then if that's the case, did he found a church? And did he give it the charism of infallibility? If he did that, then everything that follows from that church, based on that promise from Jesus, who is God, who gives it this infallible character, then everything else the Catholic Church says follows. So that road, that, that mini road to bring someone from absolute nothing to all the dogmas, the doctrine that the Catholic Church preaches, we have that um, articles, we have those podcasts. And so, we, so we're trying to dialogue with contemporary science or the literature objections, the problem of evil on the podcast and then in the articles. And then sent evangelization, I would encourage those who are listening to consider, pray over the words of Vatican II, this is Christus Dominus number 30. It says that, speaking to the pastor first, it says that he must reach, his missionary zeal must reach to all those within the parish territory. And if he's unable to do that himself, he must ask the assistance of the laity to help him. We are that laity. So God has said through Vatican II, his ecumenical council, I want everyone in the parish territory reached. Pastor can't do it. So then it's up to us. And, you know, not everyone is called to be a door-to-door -door evangelist, perhaps. Uh, but we can all pray for the apostolate, for those who are knocking doors. But for those who, you know, have a desire, you know, what what would it take uh, to to step across the street, to knock a door and to say, how can I pray for you? You know, I'm I'm a Catholic. You know, we pray for people. How can I pray for you? And just just to see what happens on Wednesday, as we were talking, Eddie, I, I knocked a door out here and a, I said just that. And a woman said, not religious, that she wants to have her two or three year old baptized. So so God has put a desire in her heart for the salvation of her child. And she's not religious. She's not against it. She's not for it. But we have to ask ourselves very seriously, Eddie, what do we expect that this where this desire will go if it's not fostered, especially in our contemporary culture? If there's not a Catholic she can reach out to today, by God's grace, 
she wants salvation for her child, but the enemy is uh, is prowling, looking for someone to devour, as it says uh, in scripture. She's She's got her husband that's not sympathetic to the faith in any way. I doubt she has a kind of a Christian community. And so, you know, someone has to be sent. And uh, that's us. So for your your listeners, the website, sentevangelization.org, we do everything completely free. You know, no one's no one's making any money. I just want to get the word out. On the site is our book, the manuscript. Uh, click book, download the manuscript. And they'll know everything uh, that we know on how to knock a door, why knock the door, and then a small gospel presentation. So that's what I would say. Thank you, Eddie, Be- for asking. Beautiful, beautiful. Can you give maybe one one story, share one story of uh, what has happened out there, knocking on doors? Yeah. Yeah, I would say maybe about four years ago, I knocked a door. A Jewish lady came outside and I said, how can I pray for you? She said, please pray for me. My partner had, uh, you know, we'd separated. I said, okay, I'll pray for you. We left. I sent her a letter. You know, God loves you, essentially. We come back that Christmas, Christmas caroling. And she invites us in. We're singing. I can't, is it Hark? Park the Herald Angels sing maybe with her, uh, her son. I come back at Easter with an Easter basket. It had my seminary brothers called a little pagan bunny, pagan Easter bunny, but a little so a little Easter bunny. I have a book in there, a Mother Teresa book. I give her the book. I never hear from her. Years pass. Then she knocks on the door of the seminary and she says, is that guy still here? Today, she's Catholic. She's my <laughs> goddaughter. So she she called, uh, I called her, she entered RCIA, uh, and she just called me the other day just to say hello. And, uh, you know, I just, I praise God. I mean, she's one, she's one story. I, another one very short, I knocked a door, she was Lutheran. She, be, she entered RCIA. Her husband then entered RCIA. And I remember watching her husband walk. It was really dark. I was helping with RCIA. I didn't know he was coming. I had asked her if she would, you know, maybe speak to him, see his thoughts. And he, I see him walking up and I said to him, I think his name's Kai. And I said, is that you, Kai? And he said, yeah. And I said, I can die now. I can die now. You know, I've seen enough. I've seen enough. So <laughs> I, uh, yeah, uh, it is. It's a great joy. Beautiful. Too much, too much, too much good. But yeah, uh, I want to thank you. Is there anything else you want to add um, before we sign off here about what you do, your story in general, you name it? I would, I would say to your listeners, pray, pray uh, for the for the co- conversion of souls. As the church teaches, the gift of a faith, the gift of faith is a gift. A Vatican one says it defines faith, and it says assisted and inspired by the Holy Spirit. So those who, for whatever reason, they don't feel like they can act, they can step across the street, well, they can pray that the Lord will give that gift of faith like that woman we ran into who already has the desire. That desire is a gift of God through somebody's prayers. So pray that that, that desire for faith is being given to these people so that when we knock those doors, uh, the, the seed of the word of God can grow and bloom. Well, yeah, it makes me think of of your apostolate you know you have the people knocking you have the intercessors that are within earshot and then you Mm -hmm. have the people that are handling kind of the packages letters letters, and and making sure that people actually feel loved not just okay peace i'll see you guys later you know um Mm -hmm. i'll never see you again you know that kind of thing so Mm -hmm. um there's a lot to consider. Very, very humbling for me personally to hear so much um, in your life and, and the Lord's grace. So I appreciate that, brother. And for everyone um, that is listening, I we pray that you enjoyed that and that you can share it, get the word out as well. Um, and then Austin, let's let's end with a glory be in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all.